Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech, my name is Alan. Star Wars during the prequel and new Disney era has normalized the use of children on the battlefield. Now obviously we could attribute this to the fact that Star Wars is a franchise that targets younger audiences and therefore it makes sense to include young characters that the audience can relate to. This is probably why most of the main characters are also humans because, you know, deaf to Xenos. But there are some serious ethical and moral issues with using children as combatants that we should definitely discuss. Especially because the Jedi Order, the supposed moral judges of the Republic, frequently use child soldiers on the battlefield. Today we're going to take a look at the underlying reasons why the Jedi did this and some of the justifications that the Jedi High Council made, along with some external pressure from the Republic government. In the new Brotherhood novel, which takes place shortly after the Battle of Geonosis, we get a lot more insight on the Republic's transition from peacetime to wartime. The sudden nature of the war combined with the real threat that Count Dooku's Separatist droid army posed was a one-two punch that overwhelmed the Jedi's senses. There was just way too much information and chaos bombarding the Jedi, the media, and the Senate. These are institutions designed to guard the Republic from imbalance and also tyranny. They're caught completely off guard. Heck, on top of all that confusion, you also had the appearance of a clone army, which had been custom ordered by the Jedi, of all people. Nothing really made sense anymore. Except for the fact that action was required to head off the massive threat that was looming in the Outer Rim from the Separatists. This, of course, was all a part of Palpatine's plan to blind the Jedi and basically sow chaos within the Force. Now, officially speaking, the Battle of Geonosis was a military action in which the Jedi assisted the clones in their usual capacity as peacekeepers uh, within the judicial forces. Officially speaking, the Jedi would not be integrated into the Republic military for another few months. And so during the Battle of Geonosis, they were the equivalent of civilian advisors tagging along with the military. A few weeks after the battle, Palpatine would use a massive terrorist attack on Cato Nemoidia, the home of the supposedly neutral trade federation, as a springboard to pass legislation that would fully integrate the Jedi into the Grand Army of the Republic. By now, we're all familiar with Palpatine's MO, create some kind of chaotic event, use that chaos to create fear, use that fear to pass some kind of legislation that will suit his ultimate goal. More cowbell, please. I gotta have more cowbell, baby. Now, prior to this happening, Chancellor Palpatine had officially requested that the Jedi prepare their Padawan for the battlefield, which actually really crosses the line of the relationship between the executive branch and the Jedi Order. It was usually up to the individual Jedi Masters where they would take their Jedi Padawan. It wasn't up to the state. For instance, during the Citadel rescue mission, Anakin Skywalker determined that Ahsoka Tano was too inexperienced for this very dangerous mission, and so he ordered her to stay back. Not that that mattered, of course, because he snuck on the mission anyway. But by requesting this from the Jedi, Chancellor Palpatine was already testing the relationship between his office and the Jedi Order. The Jedi technically weren't a part of the government system, and so there wasn't really any official authority that the Chancellor could have over them. They were more like an NGO think tank private military contractor force with like religious leanings, which honestly is a very ridiculous combination of things. But of course, Palpatine was just poking and prodding and seeing how much influence he could exert on the Jedi by taking advantage of the situation he had created in the galaxy. Furthermore, Palpatine wanted initiates and younglings to get more field experience, not in combat roles necessarily, but in roles in which they would get used to working alongside clone troopers and develop a better trust and comfort around them. You guys see where this is going, right? Behind all of this Chancellor Palpatine nonsense was Darth Sidious, a Sith Lord who had planted a kill order in the clone's brains that could be triggered on command. The target of this kill command, Order 66, was, of course, the Sith's hated enemy, the Jedi. So Palpatine's move here is to integrate the Jedi more closely with the J.A.R. so that when the time comes, it's a lot easier to kill all of the Jedi, including the younglings and the Padawans. Now, from an outsider's point of view, this all made a lot of sense, uh, especially if you believe that the Jedi would make good commanders for a military. If you follow this channel regularly, you know that I have some reservations about this. The Jedi are essentially warrior monks slash diplomats without traditional military training. I don't think they're in a good position to lead the J.A.R. But again, we have to go back to the fact that this war was started abruptly. This is such a huge and important factor. 
Sure, you had a separatist crisis boiling for years, but no one knew that they had a military force, and so the threat of the separatist droid army was scaring people into action. And while the Padawan might seem like children to you and me, for the regular individual in the galaxy, they were basically superheroes because of their force abilities. A 13-year-old Jedi kid seems a lot less helpless than a regular 13-year-old kid. The Republic military also had a clear lack of non-clone commanders, and the belief was that the Jedi would be in the perfect position to fill that role. During the Battle of Geonosis, it had been the Jedi Order who had led the clone army to the Republic's first victory. Public sentiment would have definitely supported more Jedi leadership within the army. And so Palpatine will essentially use the Jedi's uh, sense of responsibility to goad them into these leadership positions. What's even more amazing is the fact that the Jedi go along with it. Think about it. Even though the Jedi won the battle, the Jedi Order lost 187 Jedi on Geonosis, mostly during the assault on Petronaki Arena. They had only sent 215 Jedi in their task force in the first place, which means that only 13% of the Jedi who went to Geonosis came back alive. And yeah, a lot of the dead were Padawan, like Tan Euster, who almost made it to the end but then died in the last wave of Horde mode. Also amongst the dead were Padawans Lumas Itima, Stam Reith. You also had Padawan like Bard and Jace, who was lucky enough to just be wounded and captured because of his lack of skill. The only Padawan who had enough skill to survive on their own were Padawan Barris Ophi, who managed to escape the arena, and of course Anakin Skywalker, who survived as a Padawan thanks to his skill with the blade. Clearly, the Padawan as a group were not prepared for this battle at all. Had the Jedi Order been more rational and had time to assess the damage done to their order, they probably would have been more hesitant to listen to Palpatine on this matter of joining the Grand Army. Now, officially, there are two sides to this Jedi debate about joining forces with the JAR and also um, using Padawan as commanders. First, you had Jedi who supported this, including individuals like Mace Windu and Kia D. Mundi, and to a certain extent, even Yoda. And then there were those against it, individuals like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mace Windu represented the more hawkish wing of the Jedi Order. He would have found a lot in common with Jedi of the past like Revan. Mace Windu was a strong-willed individual and had no problems with dealing with his own darker tendencies, and was well prepared for the horrors of the battlefield. He saw the emergence of a Sith like Dooku as the biggest threat to the Jedi in centuries, and so he's basically blinded by all other factors. Individuals like Kia D. Mundi represented a more real politic viewpoint. It was only rational for the Jedi to step into these roles. He believed that the Jedi's abilities could help end the war very quickly, leading to less death, destruction, and economic ruin. Plus, Padawan learners already went on missions with their Jedi Masters, oftentimes facing great danger. A Padawan was different from an initiative or a youngling. They actually had training in the Force and were relatively competent and usually only deployed with an older Jedi supervising them. And so individuals like Kia D. Mundi and Mace Windu saw the deployment of the Jedi within the GAR as just another mission where they would bring their Padawan along with them. Obi-Wan Kenobi might seem like a by-the-books kind of guy, especially when it comes to mundane Jedi procedures and respecting the will of the Council, but there was always a rebellious and independent streak about him. This was thanks to his tutelage under Qui-Gon Jinn, who was considered a very unorthodox Jedi Master. One of the important things that Obi-Wan Kenobi learned from Qui-Gon Jinn was to never take things at face value. Always investigate things on your own and develop your own conclusions to situations. Don't just listen to other people. This is probably the reason why Obi-Wan Kenobi made a fantastic detective. And Obi-Wan Kenobi was immediately troubled by the fact that Palpatine wanted the Jedi to bring their Padawan along with them into battle. But he was also troubled by Palpatine's insistence that the Jedi would become soldiers for the Republic, which was actually much more important than whether the Padawan would join the war. Because the traditional relationship of the Jedi Master and Padawan was that the Padawan would follow their Master anywhere they went. I mean, what exactly would have happened if only Jedi Knights and Masters went to the war? What would the Padawan do? Just stay at the temple without direction and training? As we see with our previous example with Ahsoka Tano, whenever Anakin left her behind, it was really difficult to find her things to do. If a Jedi Master was prepared to go to war, either their Padawan was ready to follow their Master or they weren't ready to be a Padawan. You see, to the Jedi, becoming a Padawan was very much a rite of passage that meant that you were ready to defend the galaxy and use the Force. It didn't really matter how old you were. 
Obi-Wan Kenobi had actually just recently been appointed to Coleman Trevor's old council seat. At the time, the Jedi High Council was rotating different Jedi Masters into that position, and Kenobi had an opportunity to ask the entire Jedi Order to put on the brakes and consider what was going on before diving headfirst into the war. Unfortunately, right around that time, Palpatine began pressuring the Jedi to be more involved in the war. Obi-Wan Kenobi was spirited away to Cadia Nemoidia, where he was supposed to investigate a giant terrorist attack, so he was never in the Jedi Council when they were making the decision on whether they should join the JAR or not. Lastly, we have Yoda, who in my opinion was a relatively passive leader. In many ways, he was more like the speaker of a legislative body rather than an executive. He basically facilitated the debate, made sure that all sides were heard, and occasionally he did give his own opinions, but he usually went with the council majority. Yoda was also in a unique position of being a Grand Master of the Order. I mean, one of his jobs was to directly teach every youngling that was taken to the temple. He probably better than anyone knows the capabilities of all the younglings and Padawans in the Jedi Order, and I guess he determined they were prepared for battle. Some Jedi might turn to the archives to see if the Jedi have encountered similar situations before. At various times in Republic history, the Jedi have been called upon to defend the Republic from various threats, usually the Sith or the Mandalorians. During the Great Sith War, you had several Jedi Masters make a stand on Coruscant against Exar Kun's Sith invasion force. During this war, the Jedi Masters definitely had their Padawan with them. During the Mandalorian Wars, a breakaway group of Jedi led by Revan joined the Republic military force and fought against Mandalore the Ultimate's Crusades. At the same time, Jedi Master Lucian Dre, who was against joining the conflict and against Revan, had also been the architect of the secret Padawan Massacre. Dre and a group of Jedi Masters known as the Jedi Covenant had shared a prophecy that one of their Padawan would go on to bring much devastation to the galaxy. And so they ended up murdering their own Padawan as a result, bringing much shame and controversy to the Order. At the same time, the Revanchists, who supported fighting against the Mandalorians, would also lose their way, and Revan and many of his Jedi would turn to the dark side. In more recent years, during the New Sith Wars, which led to the Rusan Reformation and demilitarization of the Jedi, Lord Hoth, a Jedi Master, commanded the Army of the Light, a military force led by the Jedi designed to take out the Brotherhood of Darkness. This was a very difficult period of time for the Republic and the Jedi, and so desperate measures were taken. For instance, the Jedi really loosened their restrictions for recruiting individuals. This is in order to prevent the Brotherhood of Darkness from mass recruitment of Force users. So basically, the Sith and the Jedi were fighting for all the Force users and trying to recruit as many as possible. So you no longer had an age limitation. For instance, you could be a full-grown adult and join either side. They also didn't really care if you weren't that powerful as well. Eventually, Lord Hoth even authorized the forced separation of children from their parents in the name of preventing these kids from falling into the hands of the dark side. By the way, when I say that the Jedi used to kidnap kids from their parents, this is what I mean. So during this time period, the Jedi were basically taking anyone they could get, but this was also because they were suffering massive casualties on the front. This period of time was the result of essentially a thousand years of continuous war. So as you can see, the Republic and the Jedi had really uh, taken a lot of steps backwards here. So as a student of Jedi history, I would say that it's a really bad idea to push these young kids into the battlefield. They might have superpowers, really good reflexes, but they still have the minds and experiences of children. And so it's kind of cruel to push them into these types of situations. I also think the Jedi should have taken their time and, and hit the brakes a little bit before enacting such extreme policies. But then again, because of the nature of the Jedi Master and Padawan relationship, I think the Jedi needed to think about their own role in the Republic military first. Well, let me know in the comment section below what you think about all of this. Uh, were the Jedi correct in doing this or were they basically outmaneuvered by Palpatine? I don't know. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan. My allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.